Welcome to the show, YouTubers. Leave us a comment in the chat and smash like and subscribe as we check in on the two giants of CONMEBOL soccer. Let's do this. This is the year that the South American teams look likely to end Europeans' 20-year dominance on the World Cup stage, or is it? Today, we'll be looking at Brazil and Argentina, the two giants of CONMEBOL, and to assess their chances at Qatar later this year. I'm joined by Michael and Nigel. Kegolesso begins right now. Welcome, everybody. Great to be back with you. I'm filling in for Ian Paul Joy today in the hot seat, and I can tell you it is pretty toasty. Mike Lahoud, how are you doing, my friend? It feels good to be back. International break is here. Um, just cannot wait to start talking about things that matter, the World Cup. Absolutely. And Nigel, how are you doing, my friend? Great to be on with you again. I mean, it's so good for me to have an ex-Villa player <laughs> on the panel so regularly. <laughs> <laughs> Don't play the Villa one, mate. Just send me some wine from France and we can go on with that. As for Michael, Michael's trying to be very calm and timid right now. He says it feels so good to be back to talk about football. <laughs> That's because he's embarrassed about his American owners oh, wanting to bring an all-star game and Here you know bring go. an NBA format to the game that we love, to the world's game, and try and change that. Michael it, has right. a very Let good Let me jump in with this, JJ. Let me <laughs> jump in with this. Soccer. Hold on, Michael. It was so right. good to be, it's so good to be back because for a week and a half, I didn't have to listen to this banter from okay. Nigel. I'm just, uh, NLC bringing Jonathan, the smoke. <laughs> before we get into this, Michael needs to tell his story so people who are watching on YouTube can kind of understand what soccer is in America and how it's so different oh, from man. the rest of the world. Michael, can you please tell the story? about the soccer player or this just tell the story so there was a you know what we'll save this for k Golasso after dark we'll, we'll, we'll get our producer des norris <laughs> <laughs> we'll okay. have jobs to keep so, so michael's not going to do it i'll give you a quick version a young kid was playing soccer and his mom yanked him off at half time because he had a piano lesson so that's just the suburb love of soccer in America, where in Europe, in the rest of the world, that does not happen. If you play uh, football, I'd, I'd, I'd actually wager that that might happen in Paris. Mm, maybe uh, not in like the gritty suburbs, but like maybe in like okay. the more up, but yet, upper posh area. But the rest of the rest of France is producing some phenomenal talent that we've seen and we spoke about in the past. I'm probably going to speak about some today. So, well in the future. Let's go. Let's go, John. <laughs> All right. That sounds like a plan, Nigel. All right. Well, we're looking at Conway Ball's World Cup qualifiers. Now, first question, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we, we know that there is, there, there are a few, uh, you know, very recognizable teams in the Conway Ball region, uh, you know, but it's always, whenever we talk about this region, it's nearly always exclusively Argentina and Brazil who we're debating, uh, you know, the, having the best chances to, to win the title. I'm going to go to you first, Nigel, because you, you seem full of beans today. Is <laughs> Conway Ball's qualification zone a bit of a vacuum? It is a bit. Um, I don't know. I feel like they kind of need to kind of revamp it and make it a bit more exciting. I mean, it's not as easy as people think it is, though, because what people have to understand is South America is a very big continent and there's a lot to deal with when these national teams are traveling. You've got different time zones and you have different altitudes and it's very competitive. And all those nations in that region are very passionate football fans and they can make all the atmospheres very intimidating, very uncomfortable. And I think that's why when you look at some of the Latin American players that come out of that region, their approach to football is just truly amazing. I think because they've seen so much, probably tragedy most of the time in the countries that they're from, but also experienced so many hostile environments at a young age. That's why for some people might look at it as, as someone at 18 or 17 playing in front of 90,000 or 100,000 for one of the top clubs in Europe. That's a pressure. For them, that's not pressure. That's fun because of what they've already experienced. But I think there must be some kind of way to try and change maybe the system to make it a bit more competitive and maybe give other nations greater opportunities to make the World Cup. But the reality of it is, you look at Brazil and Argentina, these are historic nations who've been involved in so many historic World Cup um, situations and games, and they've produced some of the best players that have ever played the game. And it's a, it's a never ending factory factory of football because football is more than just a sport in these nations and we have to applaud that 
I think of how you're going to change it. The only way to change and give leverage to any other country is to have a rule that says you can get Brazilian or Argentine players to go and represent another country just uh, that you call the joker rule that they have in league. Uh, that's the only way to level the playing field because those two are this by far the two best countries in South America. Look at the the depth of their squads. Brazil and Argentina, This they could have one of their deepest squads yet in decades that they've ever had and and you're seeing it in when they go to play european teams when they go to play other teams from different continents they're smashing them argentina what they did to italy italy's not in a good vein of form but you still to go and smash them in europe that's a statement and these two are leading the race but let's not forget that the rest of the the group this is a world cup cycle that chile and Colombia. When was the last time Chile and Colombia weren't a factor in a major tournament? Both of them not there since the mid. I'd say since the later two thousands to present, they've been two teams that have surprised the Brazils, surprised the Argentina, Chile, back to back Copa America champions. Do not forget that. So there's a changing of the guard. I wouldn't say it's a vacuum just yet. Those two teams, yes, they are the talent keepers. They are the gatekeepers to the World Cup. But there's a changing of the guard with everyone else. Uruguay, Ecuador, one of the surprise teams. I think they'll surprise a bunch of teams at the World Cup. And you see that the golden generation of Chile, the golden generation of Colombia, they're in revamp mode and they're in trouble right now. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you brought up Ecuador because they are starting to look extremely interesting uh, as a team. You know, we've seen them at past iterations of the World Cup as well in the early 2000s, 2002, 2006. They were back again in uh, 2014. So certainly keen to see how they get on. And let's not forget, of course, that Peru could have also been in Qatar, but was denied on penalties by Australia as well. Now, something very topical. So I'll go to you first, Mike. I mean, you know, just speaking theoretically, what if Conmebol and CONCACAF merged for World Cup qualifiers? Because you mentioned already sort of a bit of a Copa America approach where sometimes you have had guest nations, uh, you know, come and join in, uh, you know, to, to, to spice things up a little bit. But, you know, would you sign up for a mixed Conmebol, CONCACAF uh, qualifiers? I wouldn't necessarily fancy uh, the, the states getting uh, into the World Cup if that was the case. Shots fired. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would not. We, we've seen what happens when CONCACAF teams have gone to Copa America and it, it, it gets ugly quick because it's a whole different breed and it's not a knock on CONCACAF teams. And it's just a different style of play and the travel. You are you are going down there and look at the teams that could, could cut it. Mexico, United States, Costa Rica hanging by a thread maybe. And wow. outside of that, Mike. not really. Wait, sorry. I'm sorry. Did, did Canada not qualify? Okay, <laughs> Canada. Let let's let's. They're an asterisk right now. We'll get to them at another point. Canada. They're, they're an asterisk. Okay, maybe Canada even. Listen, but, Mike. But... You can't you can't take away what Canada has done <laughs> because you your football fan as well. Just like Jonathan. Let's be real. Canada qualifying now is going to see. Bring... Nat, Nat, Natalie is agreeing with me. USMNT <laughs> yeah. would never be going no. to a World Cup. That's again. why I'm against it. That's why I'm against it. Na Natalie knows her football very, very well. Exactly. Let's keep it realistic here. <laughs> but I think with Canada, Canada have just kind of reevaluated how they used to get their talent. They went into inner city. They got a lot of inner city kids, and they've just basically been very successful with the right manager in place. I feel Canada getting to this World Cup once it actually takes place is going to breed a generation or two mm. of more footballing talent coming from Canada. I think that's really going to spread like wildfire in the country. They're growing their league domestically. Hockey, obviously, is still probably going to be the number one sport. But I feel that Canada will really grow off them qualifying. Like you said, Mike, I agree with you. I just don't think they will qualify. And again, the CONCACAF region is very complicated because you've got to think about the small islands, the likes of Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago. And you want some of those feel-good stories as well and factors for those nations to, to have an opportunity to make a World Cup as well. I just don't think them merging would be the right thing. I think that what FIFA as a whole and the governing bodies locally need to do is look at finding a way to restructure or to help these nations to have better opportunities in qualifying, you know, giving them better, I don't know, whether it's facilities or, or, or better um, options to be able to get them to qualify for the World Cup in the sense. I think that's what needs to be done. It's more of a restructuring and helping these small developing nations or these small nations to become more successful in their qualification process.
Some very, very valid points, guys. And I'm glad that Canada were brought up uh, to, to, to use a phrase I know Mike hates hearing me use. You've got so many ballers in that team at the moment. Jonathan David, Alfonso Davies. I'm really excited to see yeah. how Canada get on at the World Cup. I'm, I'm not going to have them down as like a dark horse, uh, you know, like uh, many did with Turkey at the Euros. But, you know, definitely a team that I'm very keen to see uh, at the upcoming World Cup. Right, Nigel, right back at you. Which of these two teams that we're going to discuss today, Brazil or Argentina, do you think are under the most pressure coming into the World Cup at the end of the year? I would have to say, for me, Argentina. I think yeah, the, Argentina Cop the Copa are. America has raised the Copa expectation America levels. You look at what they're doing now. And again, obviously, Lionel Scaloni is uh, the manager. And I had a playing, uh, well, Lionel Scaloni played with me at West Ham for a little period. He played in the FA played, Cup. Played final. under you. You were captain. Though. I was <laughs> captain. I was Lionel Scaloni's captain. And now he's the manager of Argentina. Um, he was a great guy, to be fair. He was really good in the dress room. And, you know, me and him got along very well. Uh, our producer wants people to know that it was because of Lionel Scaloni that West Ham lost the FA Cup final because he made a bit of a mistake in the throwing that came in and then Steven Gerrard scored one of the greatest goals in the FA Cup final that you could ever believe to equalise. Mm. And uh, we were two minutes away from lifting up an FA Cup, but that's another story. But no, he done really well. I think they're under the, mess, the most pressure because of, of winning the um, Cup, um, sorry, uh, was it Copa? Copa, Amer Copa America? Copa America. That's yeah. what I was going to get it confused with the Doyers. Yeah, Copa America. <laughs> That's what you're going to um, say. The Stanley Cup. You've been in America too long, man. Yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> but if you look at the squad and the talent that they've got there, and the difference with Lionel Scaloni in charge is, I think now Argentina looks as a national team where, yes, we have one of the greatest players to ever play the game, but everyone plays a part. I think beforehand there was too much of a reliance on Lionel Messi thinking he can do it by himself. And if you if if we both if we all actually look at this, let's think about this. Think about the two previous squads Argentina have had in the World Cup. Some would say probably that's the most two talented squads they've ever assembled together, with having the greatest football player in that squad as well. You know, and there's always a comparison of Messi to Maradona. You look at what Maradona did with players that most people can even name now who was in that squad. It was all Maradona and he did it single handedly. You look at the talent that was surrounding Messi, and it just still didn't work. But I think Lionel Scaloni now has got Argentina functioning in a team dynamic where there isn't one kind of superstar you have to focus on. Obviously, yes, it's still Lionel Messi. He can make anything happen, but it's letting all the other players play their part. And I think that there's a great expectancy, and this will probably be, you'd have to say, Messi's last World Cup, really and truly. And... I think the expectancy is on Argentina. I think it's the, the best squad playing in a team dynamic that they've assembled for a very long time. And Brazil, for me, are still in that kind of rebuilding phase where Brazil, you'd have to say there is expectancy there as well. But I would put Argentina just slightly ahead of Brazil for expectancy. So I love what you said about Lessi because you're going to see less of Lionel Messi being effective at this World Cup for a good reason because Brazil, 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 Brazil. Let's look what they did in qualification. Yes, Argentina, Copa America, that is of the past. They were hungry. They were committed. That was their big thing. I don't think that I don't think they're, they're going to be up for this one. Yes, they're going to be one of the favorites going in. Oh, I think that's Messi, Colin. <laughs> pissed at what I just said. Look at this Brazil team. They were steamrolling South American qualification, steamrolling the standings, the goal differential, just not even close. The points, not even close. And the goal scorer, they had more of the top goal scorers in South American qualification in that top five, six than any other team. It's not just Neymar that's running the show. You have different players that are now coming into form, and this is a younger Brazil team than some of the Brazilian teams of the last decade or so, and it's not down to just one player that they can be effective. There's depth in just about every single line. They can play different formations. They have flexibility. So I'm I'm very high on this Brazil team. They're, they are scary good, and they are the only ones who can beat themselves going into this World Cup. Yeah, some very, very good points there, guys. Well, let's stay with Brazil for the moment. And you've got, uh, you know, quite an eye-catching squad named by Chich. Uh, you've got, you know, Coutinho, the Arsenal trio uh, omitted, omitted as well. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing them next week uh, against uh, Tunisia at uh, Parc des Princes here in Paris. 
But, you know, this Brazil team, to Nigel's points, is is one that kind of still feels like it's in transition uh, a little bit. They've got Ghana coming up on Friday. I know that Neymar took a bit of a knock in training as well. Uh, you know, is there anybody who really jumps off the page aside from, you know, the obvious names like a Neymar uh, for you, Mike, when you're looking through this Brazil team at the moment? Gosh, I, I'm really looking to see if some of these newer names called up, I think in midfield, is where Brazil, because they have so much, so many attacking options and three, the Arsenal trio that weren't called up, I, I'm shocked at that. And I think that could be down to Chiche being like, hey, you guys are probably going to be on my list. Let me look at some of the other players to give them one last chance. And I think that's what you use this window for. Is, well, Mike, am I missing so? anyone? Yeah, absolutely. You think so? You think there's a there's a definite the Gabriel Jesus goes in. There is a if, lot if of Gabriel if Gabriel there. Jesus is not on that plane and and the likes of Gabriel Barbosa is on that plane, I'm going to be pissed. And I'm not even a Brazil fan. There will be an uproar at Rio de Janeiro International Airport. I don't even know if that's the name of the airport. Okay, but it but better you, be. Okay, Mike, you say that, but you look at some of these players called in, like Pedro from Flamengo. That kid there is done fantastically well. He really is a talent. And the difference with him is he gives you a different dynamic in the sense of how he plays because he's an old school number nine. But boy, has he got happy feet. That kid is so talented. He can be a target man. His link up play is fantastic. And he's a natural born finisher. Very similar to Haaland in the sense of like build, but ability this guy's got in. And then let's not forget, Gabriel Barbosa is not even in the squad. You haven't got Barbosa in there. Brazil have a lot of talent. And I think what he's got as well is he's got a lot of experience mixed with talent. I would say that they have just the right mix of talent and experience. But I would say the experience slightly outweighs some of the youngsters coming through where Brazil are putting themselves in a phenomenal position. It just depends on what that final squad is because they have got so much talent. I think the key to this Brazil team is a midfield in attack, you have flexibility. You you can put you have so many players who are coming into form, and th and that's why you're telling me a kid that's playing in South America, you're going to take over a guy who's having the start of a, his Premier League career of his life in Gabriel Jesus doing it against big teams. Not a chance if you want to be successful at the World Cup. You can do that in other positions, midfield maybe because you have a lot of the same players. But when I look at this midfield, the the man from Newcastle, Bruno Gramarais. Let's get the pronunciation books out. Oh, wait, jo John might correct that. you on that. Go on, John. Yeah, get, 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 get Gimarish. Okay, like I said, Gimarish. <laughs> but this, this is uh, a, back, this it, is a back guy in that... my back in my England days. That would have been uh, Guimarães or something. <laughs> Guimarães. <laughs> this is this is a guy that I, I I'm so excited to see him on the world stage. I think he's a player who's young enough, who's ready enough. And I, he just has an X factor. He can play on both sides of the ball and he'll give Brazil a different dimension. And having a player who can function as a deep lying playmaker can break plays up if need be, but also his best abilities function as a box to box midfielder. When you have so many players who can just be dynamic in that front three or front two, you need an element of surprise coming out of midfield. And the best Brazilian teams have passed that have been successful at the World Cup have had a midfield runner. I think of Cleberson in the last time they won a World Cup, the last time someone outside of Europe won a World Cup. Cleberson was the unsung hero tackling defensively, but also getting forward and creating space for the likes of Ronaldinho and that talented trio of him, Rivaldo, and Ronaldo. So I, I think well, midfield's where it's at. I'm going to say that for, for me, Mike, I agree. But I think when you look at Brazil, let's be real, they're going to be heavily reliant on the front three or however they choose to set up. And it's going to be the attacking players go and do their thing. You want a solid midfield. You need a solid midfield. You look at Casemiro, Fred and um, Fabinho. That's all you really need. You've got three players there you can rotate who can really dominate that midfield area. And the attacking players and, and fullbacks can do anything they need to do. We just had a comment where someone seems to think, believe that, I can't remember the person's name, sorry, so forgive me, they believe that Argentina has a better defence and midfield than Brazil. I would have to completely disagree. Mm. I think for me that Brazil have the better squad because the talent there is endless. And if anything happens to any of these players get injured, like you said, there's still so many other players that we haven't mentioned. Like you said, I, I feel for me personally, Gabriel Barbosa is probably the best striker in Latin America. And he's not even in the squad. And you talk about Gabriel Jesus, other players that haven't made the squad, but it's just they're so stacked 
talent wise it just depends on how they're going to set up how they're going to look to play and uh you would say yes but the, the weird thing is i don't know about you guys but i haven't really seen so much in the media or social media world about brazil brazil and this world cup there doesn't seem to be that great expectancy as we've seen in past world cups i think more so now there is a lot more focus on european countries nations than there is in latin american nations because you think about all the world cups when world cups come around it's all brazil argentina now a lot more time we're talking about european nations so that just goes to show how i feel there isn't that kind of expectancy there yeah perhaps not that kind of level of expectancy but one thing that i would say will probably encourage people uh you know about brazil's chances in particular is neymar's form if it continues since the beginning of this season because this this is a different neymar to the one we've mm -hmm. been accustomed to seeing since his signing in 2017 you know it's always kind of been a bit you know the, there's been a sense of frustration really in paris that PSG haven't seen the best of Neymar or they've only seen the best of him in short spurts. But since the beginning of this season, this is a focused Neymar. You know, he's very obviously motivated for this season, whether that's with PSG or mainly with Brazil because he knows it's leading into the World Cup or a bit of both because obviously it's a new lease of life for players at PSG at this moment in time under Christophe Galtier. Either way, I mean, you look at the statistics at the moment, we'll get on to Messi's start to the season later as well. But, you know, this is a Neymar who returns Returned to preseason training early, looked in very good shape, uh, you know, and has been extremely motivated uh, and, you know, almost, you know, one track minded uh, on the pitch at times. Yes, there's been the odd flare up with the likes of Mbappe, but you look at that sort of telepathic, uh, you know, understanding that he has with Messi sort of back to their best from the Barca days, uh, you know, and it really does feel like it's, you know, potentially going to be an exciting World Cup for both players. Like I said, we'll touch on Messi later, but Neymar, for me, this is the Neymar that PSG thought they were getting from Barca, you know, all those years ago. And to have him potentially going into the World Cup in this kind of form is really exciting because, you know, it's, it's difficult to find so many positives for a World Cup that's slap bang in the middle of a season. But when you get some of the best players in the game, you know, on their day, uh, you know, going into it in this kind of form, uh, you know, you just have to be looking forward to to seeing, you know, superstars like Neymar doing their thing. I don't know how you guys are you know, feeling about, you know, whether Neymar will be able to be, you know, a star, a star figure yeah. for Brazil at uh, this World Cup, Mike? Oh, I'm having flashbacks to the 2002 World Cup. A man by the name of Ronaldo, the fat one, not the skinny one. The original. And the original. So, and I'm totally just forgive me, Ronaldo, because you are my childhood hero on the soccer field. This is a player who there were so many doubters going into that World Cup, injury woes, just tore it up in the Italian Serie A, one of the most difficult leagues at that time, defensive leagues in particular, goes in the World Cup and uses the World Cup as his fuel to put on a show. And what happens to Brazil? Rehabs gets his knee correct. No one is expecting a performance that he puts in. Brazil launched straight to a World Cup you know, win, which is a big deal. <laughs> So when I look at this, the way Neymar is playing, when I when I look at the, the the fuel to his fire, it's I don't think it's winning the Champions League with PSG. I think this is what he's lived for. This is the way that he can just right all wrongs. And the Brazilian national team has always been an escape for him. He always finds a way, whether he has he's, he's on one leg or or fully fit, he always finds a way to get on the plane and play for Brazil because there's freedom, freedom from the media, freedom to express himself. And now that he has a group that I think matches his ambition, I think you'll see the best out of Neymar at a, at a World Cup. And mind you, 2014, Brazil, I think it could have been a very different story and potentially would have been a very different story had Neymar been fit to go up against Germany because that is a massive creative loss that they had. And the Germans were, they were the best team that was there in Brazil for that World Cup. But this is a different Brazil. The, the fact that the pressure isn't there, so much eyes are on Argentina. Internally in Brazil, the expectation is always high. The expectation is to win. And I think when you have a player like Neymar, when you have players that are really flexing their stuff all around Europe and South America, this makes this team unpredictable and scary, scary good going into the World Cup. Yeah, I just think that um, for me, Neymar's form is absolutely fantastic. I think there's two things we need to look into that. I think the changes that Paris Saint-Germain made 
with the director of football that's coming in, the new managers play the part. I think it's kind of a no-nonsense manager approach. Yes, you are Neymar, but if you're not playing well, you're going to be on the bench. I do feel that he's got tunnel vision, like Jonathan said. He's really focused on this World Cup. And let's remember, it's a World Cup in wintertime. So that's why he's probably had to start well and trying to maintain, because now it's not a World Cup at the end of the season. It's during winter. You've probably seen the best of Neymar now, because I think all the distractions of being in Paris when he first got there kind of out of his system, as some people would say, there's a lot of models in Paris with some great wine. Everywhere you go, there's models <laughs> everywhere. That could be a big distraction for uh, Neymar, the pa the party boy. But um, I that think sounded that like you I pre podcast night. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's not me. That's not me. Uh, well, after anyway, dark. after dark. I think all the distractions out of his system now, and I think he really realizes what's going on. And it's also the fact of not just what's happened at Paris Saint Germain, but also the Brazilian national team. They've taken that burden off it that we're just about Neymar. Because you look at the other talents now, you've got Anthony that's just joined Manchester United. You've got, obviously, Casemiro. You've got so many players at top clubs in Europe that it's not just about Neymar. So um, we're definitely seeing a lot more focus, Neymar, and it's more about the World Cup than anything else that I, I, I feel. Yeah, some great points there. Right, guys, we will take a quick break and then we'll be right back with you for more goodness with Mike and Nigel. The UEFA Champions League. Nine months of heart stopping, hold your breath, acceleration. While Mbappe shines in the city of lights, Benzema dragging up the hat tricks, and the Reds want Mo Magic in Liverpool. This ain't amateur hour. This is the best of the best of the best. This is the UEFA Champions League. Stream every match live on Paramount Plus. Welcome back, YouTubers. I'm filling in for Ian Paul Joy today. He's too busy installing TVs in his studio to be with us. So I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by Mike and Nigel. And we're going to turn our attentions now to Argentina. Now, we've already mentioned them a little bit. Uh, Scaloni's reign, impressive so far. Copa America winners, finalissima success, 33 games undefeated. And of course, Scaloni played under our own Nigel Rio Coca at West Ham. Now, Nigel, what's when when he was a player, uh, a teammate of yours, did you get any sort of inkling at all that he would be, um, you know, a manager who is capable of handling all of the, you know, the star talent that a, a team like Argentina boasts on their roster? Oh, no, wait. Just before we get into that, Jonathan, I don't know if our producer can put it back up. Someone just made a great point. I think mm -hmm. the last one we just saw, Carl Davis, I think that is oh. a fantastic point. That's someone that knows a bit of football. Not this, not the next one. Oh, the look, Paqueta and Fred? Yeah. I think that is a great point there. I think uh, Gimeres oh, is Nigel Rio Cook going in on Lucas Paqueta, West Ham's new star signing. I haven't seen. I haven't seen what a lot of people you, have seen yet. I'm sorry. When you're you Brazilian, mad? when you go there, you hit that ground running. There's no time are you to adapt. Mad? You, let's just see. <laughs> Paqueta, I haven't seen what Paqueta people have seen yet with Brazil. When he puts on the Brazil shirt, it's a different. You're not surrounded domino. by Brazilian players when you're playing at West Ham, mate, in the Premier League. Different kettle of fish. Anyway, back to what Jonathan said. Great point there, Carl Davis. Um, yeah, I never expected that. If I'm honest, for my times of playing him, he was a real nice guy. Really, really nice guy in the dressing room. We got along very, very well. Funny guy, and I just never expected that. But I think that it's it's interesting because when I cover a lot of Latin American football, and then I cover obviously the European football, the main difference I see for me is discipline there's a greater element of discipline in european football where you're coached to know your position know your responsibilities and that's what a manager expects you to do and if you don't do it you don't play while in latin american football they're given a lot more freedom to express themselves to be attacking and you know there's not so much discipline and structure and it's no surprise that palmeiras have a portuguese manager who came from europe into um brazil and coach with that European kind of style and discipline. And that's why they've been back-to-back -back Copa Libertadores champions. So a lot more discipline is being implemented in Latin American football. And I think that's what Lionel Scaloli's probably done slowly from his experience in Europe, implementing that kind of discipline factor, that structure, that organization out of possession and in possession with probably a greater assurance and determination. And to be able to coach and get all these players together to be playing as a unit is fantastic credit and achievement to him. It really is, because it's not it's it's not something that's easy to do. And the fact of you're coaching Lionel Messi, one of the greats of the game, and you're going to tell him, this is what I want from you, and he's going to listen and respect you, I think that goes a long way. And uh, 
full credit to him. He really has done a fantastic job. And I wouldn't be surprised if when he leaves Argentina, he gets the West Ham job, probably. I think the what Scaloni's done has nothing to do with Messi. It has everything to do with the rest of the team. This is the first time I've seen Argentina under Messi where it's not about Messi. And I think in the media, we get it wrong with this Argentinian team. In the Copa America finals, who stepped up? It wasn't Messi. Di Maria and Rodrigo De Paul were the two best players on the field. Seeing other Argentine players realize, wait a second, we can be the heroes, we can be the leaders of this team, is a difference maker for Argentina. It makes them a more unified front. And if anything, what Scaloni's done is said, hey, you have the ability to contribute. I look at leaders like Nicolas Otamendi. He's becoming more vocal. Rodrigo DePaul, they're becoming more vocal. Angel Di Maria becoming more vocal. And it gives the creative space for Lionel Messi, who is a very introverted person, to go and just do messy things, which is special. It's just no one can do what he does. So I think the rest of the team is saying, okay, lads, let's get together. We know we have the most gifted player on the planet who can do anything at any given moment. But let's take control of this team. And if you're a manager like Scaloni, that is ingenious because so many managers of the past have said, this is Messi's team and let's let's cave into what Messi wants. And you've seen certain players not step on the field, other players step on the field because they're good friends with Messi, et cetera. Now there's more balance into that locker room chemistry. And I think Scaloni deserves full credit, but also the rest of the team deserves even more credit because you look at the goal scorers, Lautaro Martinez, a couple of years ago, Martinez wouldn't have been a factor in this team. He was tied joint top scorer with Lionel Messi with seven in South American qualifiers. That is massive. He is the main man at Inter now. And that confidence that he got from Copa America, and, and that's really where he broke out. You're seeing that in the European game, and you're also seeing it with Argentina. Martinez's ability to drop deep and almost function like a false nine, he's not running into Messi's space. Him and Messi now, there's mutual respect. They're looking to play off each other. Um, Angel Di Maria is running through. There's just more of just a dynamic flair to this Argentine team. Mind you, this Argentine team, when it was Messi-centric, and it still is very much a, a Messi-heavy team because you have Lionel Messi, uh, they didn't have some of those other players playing to their strengths. Now I, I think that you have more of a complete team than you have in a long while. Oh, look at that picture there. Name the boy band, guys. Name the boy band. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know oh. what? Keep an eye on the guy in the middle, McAllister. That is, I think that's a guy that I, I love. I love what he's doing for Brighton. We've talked about him a lot on the pod. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you got to think about, let's not talk about Alvarez at Manchester City. Mm. That kid is an absolute pest. Really, real good pest. Got an eye for a goal. Great talent. Another one they can bring on that can make a difference in some games. I just wanted to say, Mike, you said it in the end. So you're going to give everything you've said about the players, you're 100% right. But again, who do you give credit to? When players transform like that, it's mm. only the manager that does that. The manager encourages, the manager speaks to them, puts his arm around the shoulder to say, yes, Messi is one of our star players, but I want you to take more responsibility. I want you to do this and do that. So that's exactly what you said in the end, that you've got to give credit to Linus yeah. Coloni. And I think someone made a point as well to saying that Argentina should have worked this out two World Cups ago. And you're 100% right. As much as you can have talented players, they're only good as their team. You know, the modern game has changed so much now that everyone is athletic. And if any player takes an off day, your team will be punished. At the highest level of football, every player needs to be at it. And you can't just rely on one, no matter how talented player he is. If your defence ain't good enough, you're going to get punished on the opposite end, regardless of how much of a talented player you might have in your attacking option. But again, like Mike said, just to add to it, I agree with him. And I think that for what people have to understand is... It comes from management. It comes from great leadership for these players to take the emphasis and take the message on board to come out and become more dominant, more greater leaders. They don't just do it naturally. Manager has to back them and encourage them to say, see that in yourself. I see it in you. And full credit to Lionel Scaloni. Well, before we tie a bow on this Argentina section, just another update from Paris, where Messi himself is also enjoying a very productive season as well. And let's, let's not forget, we've talked about how this Argentina side is not as Messi-centric as it used to be, but this is also the first World Cup that Messi will be going to not as a Barcelona player. And obviously when he was at Barca, that entire team, that entire system was built around him. He expected 
you know, Argentina to kind of mirror that. He's now had a year in Paris where it's not all about him. You know, he's come up against someone in in uh, Kylian Mbappe who, you know, commands to be top dog and, and, you know, has earned that status based on the form over the last 18 months. So now Messi, I feel, is almost coming into this World Cup mm. under a little less pressure, but in much better shape than his first season in Paris. Uh, you know, and also similarly to Neymar, I mean, t- only time will tell if they lose their motivation this season after the World Cup, but certainly looks, you know, focused, uh, you know, and ready to deliver. And Mike, you want to, uh, you want to embellish, uh, embellish my point, or uh, yes. uh, are we going to have, are we going to have Nigel raining on our parade here? No, no, no. I was just getting, I was just getting the violin sure. out when we talked about <laughs> Messi you know, being at Barcelona no more. So I'm just playing the violin. Messi's not at Barcelona no more. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, hey, that must I be the Mendoza out. wine that you showed us in the group chat talking, Nige, because I, I love that oh, tune. Fact, fun fact, Mike. Messi drinks from that wine vineyard as well. Yeah. There's a picture one time when he was in Barcelona and he had cases of that wine being loaded onto a private jet, but I don't know wow. if my, if John wants me to get the violin out again. That Messi's on a private. <laughs> oh, jet. you need you need oh, to br- you need to brush off your boots, Nigel, because if Messi's drinking that, then maybe you can squeeze another couple of years out of your career. Wow, oh, that's a, taking, well, it's, a, it's a great point okay. that uh, Carl Davis <laughs> just made. By the way, Latour Martinez is slowly becoming more a Benzema kind of striker for Argentina. I I agree with some of that sentiment. Because that ability to drop off and not just be the out-and-out striker, the lead striker for Argentina, um, it gives them a different dynamic. And we saw it against Italy in Finalissima. Uh, two out of their three goals came from Martinez dropping off and helping in the build-out. Argentina is a team that like to build out and and play tiki-taka a bit because they, they have the players, the technical players, with European pedigree. But going back to Messi, and JJ, I, I love the point you played er, – er, said about Messi and how he's functioning as PSG. What he's doing at PSG is, yes, we know he can score and be definitive in front of goal, but his assists. When you look at some of the the goal scorers coming into this Argentine team, Martinez is a player who thrives off service from wide and also from deep, needs a playmaker from deep who can put those balls into channels, put those balls, that final pass, that killer pass. Look for him, Angel Di Maria. I love what they've also done with this squad that they they've called up, they're rewarding players who are in form. And that, that's the, that's a bit of the worrying sign for Brazil, given the fact that Brazil are leaving out players who are in form for players like Bremer, who are not in form playing for Juve, who are crap right now, whose manager is going to be sacked. We'll talk about that on the pod next time. Juve fans. But when I think of Argentina, the fact that Enzo Fernandez, this is a kid that plays for Benfica. Love this guy. Loved him in that yeah. matchup against Juve. They're calling up, Alexis McAllister, you know, the 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 McKelly, or Macaulay Culkin wannabe from Argentina. Um, and I think of Nico Gonzalez, who's out at Fiorentina. These are players who are being rewarded for the good seasons that they've had in the last six months and now are coming into the national team fold because you never know who are going to be your diamonds in the rough that could be the difference maker at the World Cup. We've seen it time and time again. The teams that win, teams that have deep runs, have an X factor who comes off the bench and becomes a staple in the team when it counts. I just want to add to that, John. Quick, I just want to add to what Mike said. Hundred percent right. I think what we're seeing as well is Messi's become more of a facilitator. He's become more of a creator, and that's just the ability that he possesses. He's still going to warrant a lot of attention in the fact that he's dropping deep, getting the ball. He has the ability to make those passes. What he needs is willing runners understanding of his teammates, which he's got in Argentina, and it's still going to be dangerous. That's the evolution of Messi. We're not going to see the Messi of old picking up the ball, skipping past four or five players and then put it in the top corner. It's the evolution of the football player. He's playing very uh, similar. He can play a Pielo role for Argentina, as Pielo did for, for Italy. And that's just the ability that he possessed. And again, it goes to the argument that people want to argue about Messi or Ronaldo, Messi or Ronaldo. Messi's evolved as a footballer Mm. as much as we as fans would love. He had the ability of getting past players and he still does have the ability to skip past players if need be. But why does he need to do that now when he's surrounded by good players, young players, willing runners to run in behind who are a threat and just as uh, got got good ability to score goals and create things. And Messi can just be the facilitator now just making those passes because he makes those passes look so easy and they're not. And that's just the quality that he has in this Argentinian side. I just want to give a shout out as well to Ian Joy with his feet up, 
watching us on his TV <laughs> that he never put up that someone else came into his house put up with a hammer and a drill because Ian Joy is just not good with a hammer and a drill in his hand. You know what, Nigel? That is the perfect segue into this next <laughs> section because Ian is going to be absolutely fuming that he's missing out on this chat. Now, as an Englishman, when we're talking about Argentina, we're talking about Conmebol teams, when I, I always grew up looking at Conmebol sides as kind of like the <laughs> the, t- the teams that had the most what is now known as shit housery in the modern game. Like they had the best skills at that, you know, to be able to like, you know, I guess you call it the dark arts as well to be a little more polite. But it's something that, you know, you always worry about the, the, the South American teams having in their locker, bringing it out. Every Englishman remembers 1998, Beckham getting sent off against Argentina, Diego Simeone, Carlos Roa, guys like that. Now, as ex-players, you know, how much of a factor is that? I'm going to go to Nigel first to ask about it. Like, how much, how do you, how do you relish that as a player? Do you relish it even? Uh, and is it something that, you know, you're wary of when you're coming up against some of these uh, sides? Well, I learned quite young. I remember when I was playing for England under 21s and we used to play, obviously, France and, you know, most of the European nations. And we had uh, a lot of foreign players within our, our ranks in the younger days. And it was funny that some of these players used to say to me, for some reason, whenever England played any other nation, there was so much hatred for the English nation. I think us as English players, we didn't realise it. And it's only till I had conversations with some of these players that managers go above and beyond for their... They can lose all year round. They don't care. But when it came to playing against England, there was another level of competitiveness and there was like, it was a matter of life and death just to beat England because of the hatred that they had for the English nation and and English uh, footballs for some reason. So I learned from quite a young age that there was that extra bit of competitiveness when we played anyone because no matter who we're playing, they seem to raise their game against England. And some of the players who I was friends with will tell us that the managers give them an extra incentive just to beat England because they hated England so much. So you're very aware of it. And you know teams raise their level in their game and there is that edge to it. And then there's always that history about it. You know, so for the football fans over, I need to understand there's a lot of history that goes on to these nations and it's world history. It's beyond football, but that world history goes on to that football pitch where some managers and coaches might bring up things that have happened in the past whether it's wars or, you know, disagreements, territory and stuff like that, that will go into that dressing room. And then the whole pride aspect of it, you're representing England, the three lines on your shirt, all that kind of psychology is thrown in there, depending on a manager or coach. So that does play a part that some of these games, it's more than just a football game. It literally is a pride of the nation that you're playing for. I look at some of the European teams and from a club standpoint, and we in Africa, we never got to play against some of the South American teams on the international level. But in club football, we got to play against some of the South American teams. And there was a level of desperation when it came down to it. It's a knife's edge that when it came down to it, there was just this level of I will do whatever it takes to win this football match. Even if that means running through you, even if that means punching you in the face, stomping on your feet, giving you an elbow to the gut. Luis, Luis gets Suarez it. against Ghana. <laughs> yeah, you see it in those moments. You, you, you know, I, I think back to one moment I remember having, I forgot, we played the team from South America in a friendly before season in 2010. And I'd actually assisted on the first goal. Uh, don't say that that often in my career, but assisted on the first goal and you know, thinking, oh my gosh, I'm having a worldie thinking about, oh, man, I'm going to get signed, move on, go play abroad. Corner kick. I'm standing next to this guy who's maybe like 5'2". The fella literally, the referee looks away, looks at us and says, hey, you know, no jostling, no pushing. Guy goes, okay, okay. Fella literally punches me in the stomach, goes and bangs (laughs) in the header. 1-1. I get taken off at half because I didn't mark. There goes my European dream. So in that moment, I realized, and I was sitting there saying, ref, but he hit me. And in that moment, I realized there is a level of desperation and and just I will do whatever it takes to win. We've seen it. England, Argentina, Simeone, Beckham of that is the X factor that that South American teams have, that they're willing to go to a place. Suarez, Ghana, they're willing to go to a place that it is win at all costs, because that is ingrained in the DNA of the culture that football is literally life itself. It's not 
oh, it's it'd be nice to win. It's we have to win and we'll win at all costs. And you've seen it time and time again. And there's always a team that brings up that moment of madness that either costs their team or allows them to advance. And I, I, I remember that Suarez handball. I was gutted as an African. I Oh, man, every World Cup, I'm always rooting for an African team, not just the U.S. men's national team. Nigel, thank you very much. Um, and I thought Ghana had the chance to do well, something your, special. Your MLS detractors will be delighted to hear that. I did say U.S. men's national team, so shout out to my MLSers. But um, I, I just thought in the moment, I was so upset, so angry, felt felt – like I was a Ghanaian fan, felt cheated. But when I go back, I thought, what a moment of madness that any of us, if you had asked us in hindsight, any of us would do to get your team that further <laughs> forward, you know? <laughs> and it's just so Luis Suarez in Uruguay, no one blinked an eye saying, ah, that's Suarez fella. Yeah, we 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 advanced, but he 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 cheated. They're like national hero give him the medal of the uruguay medal of freedom put him <laughs> build a statue mike one of jonathan wanted to say you're soft which he's 100 percent right you're soft because <laughs> you played in the days where there was no var when you're oh, marking man. the corner listen mike i used to mark in corners and i used to hate it until they moved me to the edge of the box you know why yeah i wasn't the best jumping i couldn't jump you know, and if the white man can't jump, no, there's black man can't <laughs> jump. That's me. No problem. But if I can't jump, you're definitely not going to win the header. So, you know, the old school dark arts you used to step on their toes just before the corner come in or you used to use a fist and put punch them in the never region. So then they go down. Oh, you see that famous man. picture of Paul, uh, Vinnie Jones grabbing <laughs> Paul Gascoigne? That was me in the corner. That was mm. my style, the dark arts. All right. Mm. We were in the days before VAR. So you had to compete. You talk about Suarez, look at Maradona, the hand of God. Mm. That still hurts the English people to this day on. And then wasn't there an incident as well with Thierry Henry in Ireland? Oh, <laughs> there was an man. incident with Thierry Henry in Ireland as well, right? Yeah, and, our, uh, our, 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 producer, our producer, producer Des has been giving us a lot of smoke <laughs> in the chat about how Ireland need the World Cup to be expanded to 60 teams to get back in. But we'll save that yes. until we turn our eyes back to Europe and the hope falls for the next World Cup. Uh, anyway, guys, it's been, uh, it's been a fantastic episode. Let's round it out with some final thoughts because there are some other hopeful in the Conmebol region as well. You've got the likes of Ecuador, Uruguay. I'm going to go to you first, Mike. Is there anyone else you're keeping your eye on outside of Argentina and Brazil? Uh, Ecuador. I think this is an Ecuadorian team that not many teams are taking seriously, and that'll suit them perfectly fine. I look at some of the players that they have that are playing in the Premier League, Estupinha. Let's just say the, the key players for Brighton. The fact that they have more players moving to some of the top leagues in the world and becoming an instant factor will be good. And shout out to the MLS as well. Uh, a player that I'm very big on, LAFC's um, Jose Cifuentes. He's a box-to-box -box midfielder, was part of that U20 team that finished third place in the U20 or U20 2019 mouth filler World Cup. They have a coming of age. Another player that was at Wolverhampton and came to Major League Soccer, Campania, who plays for Inter Miami. They have this group of players who are the core of the team that are also enmeshed with players who are a little bit older than them that are playing their best stuff in Europe right now. They can beat you athletically. They have the talent. They have the individual moments of brilliance, and they are bigger than just Ener Valencia, who's now the experienced head, a player who's a proven goal scorer internationally at World Cups and a commonable um, World Cup qualifying. So they are, they are one of the dark horses in their in their group that no one's taken seriously. Yeah, I'd have to agree with Mike that I think Ecuador really are a bit of a frightening talent. You know, you look at Caicedo in uh, at Brighton right now, he's becoming a phenomenal midfielder. I can't see Brighton holding on to him for much longer. One of the big boys in Europe are going to have to bite their hand off for that talent. Phenomenal. And they've also got a fullback, a controversial fullback, who, whether he's Colombian or Ecuadorian, <laughs> um, Castillo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that kid is phenomenal. He really is phenomenal. He plays for Barcelona in Ecuador and he is a phenomenal talent. He is the modern day fullback. So any scouts or any chief executives watching this show with some real knowledge that's being passed out to them, go get that kid. Castillo is a fantastic fullback. He really has all the attributes and the ability to play in Europe. And they're just two players I've named, but phenomenal talent like you said talent playing in all over the place and there really is a resurgence of ecuadorian football and i think they will be the surprise package more so than anyone else from that region 
Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of guys in this squad who have now picked up the baton from the likes of Antonio Valencia, who obviously, uh, you know, was evergreen right up until his retirement back in 2021. And just to finish off on Ecuador, it is, you know, really encouraging as well to see how many of those young players are now playing their trade in Europe as well. You know, you've got a handful of defenders, guys like Piero uh, Hincapié, uh, who's at mm. uh, Bayer Leverkusen. You've got a couple of guys dotted around in Belgium as well. We've got one guy here in France, Jackson Porozo with uh, Trois. So, you know, it is a really, really exciting time for Ecuador. And I know there's a lot of hype surrounding them. So they will definitely be a team for us to keep an eye on at the World Cup. Well, guys, thanks so much for listening to Kegola. So please take a minute to leave us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere you listen to your podcast. And we're also available as video. So subscribe to us on YouTube and visit us there as you're doing at the moment, tuning in to this live. And it's thanks to Mike and Nigel for joining me and until next time it's goodbye from us.